turning this evening to the book of Ezekiel, one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. Ezekiel, and we're commencing to read uh, chapter 9 and verse 1. Ezekiel, chapter 9 and verse 1. Now, we haven't time to read chapter 8, but chapter 8 obviously precedes chapter 9, in that it tells us of the Lord supernaturally bringing the prophet into the temple in Jerusalem. And this was a time whenever God was about to manifest his judgment, and that judgment was going to come from the north through the Chaldeans. And the Lord here is speaking to his prophet, to his servant Ezekiel, and he's letting him know things that were going on in chapter 8, and it was primarily idolatry, but you can read it at your leisure, we'll look at a few verses later, but they were given to all forms of idolatry in chapter 8. And in the light of that, in chapter 9, the Lord speaks again to his servant. And we read in chapter 9 and verse 1, The Lord cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon, or it means an axe head, a destroying weapon in his hand, and behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughtering weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, that was the seventh man, with a writer's ink horn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, that was the altar where the sacrifices were offered, and it was the largest piece of furniture in the tabernacle and the temple, just outside the Holy of Holies as you were coming in through the court. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherub, or your cherubim, whereupon he was to the threshold or the door, just the, 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 the doorstep going out the entrance, threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry, for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In my hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man on whom is the mark, and begin in my sanctuary. Then they began as the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. Came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left. That I fell upon my face and cried and said, O oh Lord God, wilt thou destroy the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury on Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. And the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, my eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. But I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the incorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. <clears throat> Amen. And God will bless this reading of his truth. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come now with thy word, O oh God, we need thine help to declare it. I pray that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would so enlighten us. And Father, just as we have prayed earlier, that you would make us those in these last days, Lord, that really know the times, Lord. O oh, Heavenly Father, I recognize my utter helplessness and uselessness. And so I give myself wholly over to thee. 
I claim thy cleansing and sanctifying power of my spirit, soul, and body. And I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost. I take and I bless thee, Lord, that he, the Holy Ghost, will undertake. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. And Amen. A number of years ago, I decided to put a stereo in my car. I wasn't that capable of doing the thing, but I didn't want to pay someone, so I decided I would do it myself. And I put the speakers into the back, and I put the radio into the car, and I didn't look at anything at all. I just kind of set the handbook to the side, and after a little while, I started pushing wires in here and there, and all of a sudden, I noticed there was smoke coming out of the speakers at the back. And I thought that wasn't a good sign. And then no matter what I tried, nothing worked. And eventually I looked at the handbook. And in the handbook it was set aside, there was a good part of it was given to all the non-essentials, just little information about buttons and so on, how to switch the radio on and off. But then there was a little area that was set aside and it was essential reading. And the essential reading said that there was particular wires that were not to be put in particular places and I didn't read that. <clears throat> and I put the wires in the places where I wasn't meant to put them, and so I blew the system up. What's that got to do with Ezekiel chapter, 20, chapter 9 and 8 and 9? Well, I want to speak to you what God has impressed so powerfully onto my heart for this reading tonight, and that is critical truths for the last days. Critical truths for the last days. I don't think there's any of us would deny that we're in the last days. Uh, regardless of your eschatology, whether you're amillennial, premillennial, or whatever, uh, everybody agrees with the events that are happening in Israel and the fulfillment of prophecy that we are in the last of the last days. The Church of Jesus Christ is still preaching the Word of God. Thank God for that. She's still expounding the truth. And thank God for that. But I believe tonight with all my heart that the church largely has been waylaid into ministering in these last days on the non-essentials. Now don't misunderstand me because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. But you see it's possible to have an understanding of the scripture. It will become more apparent what I'm saying now as we go through the message. But it's possible to have a good understanding of the scripture and still not grasp critical truths for the last, the last days. And I believe tonight what God has given me are critical truths. They are the essential reading. They're the ones that you have to know. You have to know these for the last days. The first one that is apparent to me from Ezekiel chapter 9 is the announcement of divine retribution. Here the Lord cried to the prophet Ezekiel in verse 1 in a loud voice. The Lord made it absolutely clear to Ezekiel who was the prophet who had a listening ear for God and who was in touch with God. And the Lord wanted him to understand that God was now drawing near to Jerusalem, to his people, for judgment. He wanted them to know that that was going to happen and there was no way it was going to be reversed. There was no amount of praying was going to change it. What had been designed and what had been foretold by the Lord was now going to come to pass. It's one of those occasions that we read of like in Job, where the Lord lifts the veil off the natural and permits us to look into the realm of the supernatural. And what's very, very interesting about Ezekiel chapter 9 is that the Lord says there are six men who are set aside. Now most commentators, and I take the view with them, is that these six persons are six angels. 
and they are given the responsibility, it says in verse 1, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. They have responsibilities over the city. And if this is paralleled across the land, which there's no reason to doubt it, then there are angelic beings that are over particular areas and regions. And the Lord says, I want them to draw near. And so heaven is on the move. Earth is largely unaware of it. Israel, Jerusalem at this time is unaware of it. Apart from one prophet called Ezekiel. God is showing Ezekiel what's happening. It's like a living nightmare. A living nightmare. And Ezekiel is brought into God's confidence. And God not only relays it to him in his ears, but God permits him to see it with his eye. And God can do that. God can come to his servants and God can let them see literally an event that is to unfold in the future. God can do that. He gets an insight like the day of Job when the angel are before the throne and Satan comes among them and asks about Job and you know the conversation goes on chapter 1 and 2. So the announcement's given, retribution's coming. You know, one preacher has said, and it's very true, the fact that the subject of divine wrath has become taboo in modern society, Christians by and large have accepted the taboo and contributed and conditioned themselves never to raise the matter. We are living in such a period now in church history where the Lord has so departed from us where divine retribution is so near, where the reality of God is so un, so foreign to even us in the church, that we cannot tell anymore or distinguish the things of God from the things of man. And as we gradually drift further and further from God, knowing Him experimentally, then the great fundamental truths of the gospel are gradually taken away. They're eroded and removed. And so therefore hell is no longer popular, so we dare not preach it. It's not popular, we can't preach it. This is what happens always in a period of divine displeasure as the church moves further from God. And it always takes that great outpouring of the Spirit, that great illumination on the Word of God again, that great heart turning to God, that these truths are rediscovered and they reemerge and they're re-preached with power and unction and conviction and an impact is brought on a godless society again. But make no mistake about it, God, the God we worship, is a God of divine retribution. He is a God of wrath. Now, some people say, and perhaps they're right, in that these six angels were given power, they had weapons that they used for to destroy the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And some Jewish historians take the view, and perhaps they're right, that these literal angels gave power for certain things to happen. And Jewish historians say that the first angel was wrath. That there was wrath let loose through the people. The second one was anger. The third one was fury. The fourth one was destruction. The fifth one was a breach. The sixth one was consumption. In other words, all these different things where society was falling to pieces was an outpouring of wrath from an angel on the community. If that is true, then it's very easy to see how God can punish a community. Six men. Some say they were representative of the northern army that came by the north. And ultimately destroyed the city. The first critical truth for the last days is divine retribution. 
The second one is the delusion that accompanies idolatry. A delusion that accompanies idolatry. You see, these people, the people of God, were given wholly to idolatry. Chapter 8, you can read at your leisure, but you'll discover no matter where the Lord brought Ezekiel in the temple or in the places where his house was set aside for the worship of his name, God says, no matter what he showed him and no matter how abominable it was, God says, turn aside, I'll show you even what's worse. And it just progressively gets worse through the chapter. Until at the last verse of chapter 8, God says, you can understand now why I've got to deal with this thing. You see, in chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, Then said he, the Lord, or the angel, unto the, unto the Son of Man, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel, that's the old men, uh, the leaders of Israel, do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord saith us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. The delusion that accompanied the spirit of idolatry that had come right into Jerusalem and right through the people of God on the whole, this thing that was, that was now pervading society, the general consensus of the people was that the Lord doesn't see it. The Lord doesn't see this. In other words, there were those who said they didn't believe that God could see what was going on in their hearts. Their hearts were not toward God at all. They were going through the ritual of the temple. They kept the sacrifices going. They kept the building. They kept the altar. They kept the priesthood. But it was all corrupted. Their hearts were solely given over to the worship of other gods. They no longer worshipped the Lord their God with all their heart. And that was idolatry. Now they said that they didn't believe God could see it. There's one, there's one thing worse than saying you don't believe God sees. And that is by behaving as though God doesn't see. That's the one thing worse. Oh, you can say in church, I believe God sees, but then you behave all the way as though he doesn't see. And brothers and sisters, I believe it with all my heart, and nothing will shift me unless the Holy Ghost shows me otherwise, but the greatest sin tonight in the church of Jesus Christ is the sin of idolatry. We have an idolatrous church tonight. We have a church that is impotent and powerless. A church that is making little or no impact for God. She is not moving in the realm of the supernatural, but the superficial. She is gradually becoming no different to those who are in false religions. Her only bonus seems to be that she can argue from scripture. But she certainly does not have the marks of the divine with her anymore, to any great degree. You see... There was a total ignorance of God's presence in this day. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. They didn't know the Lord's presence anymore. They just, they just went through the ritual. How many have went in and out of the house of God today or in weeks gone by or months or years of their lives and they, they, they just go on. They live for the world. They're perfect picture in the Old Testament. Abraham, the God seeker. Abraham's the man of faith. Abraham's the man who's living in promises. Abraham's the, the man who's got his, his, his face fixed as a flint toward the Lord. But Lot, Lot's living for time. Lot's living for money. Lot's living for business, but he's still got a sprinkling of evangelical religion around him. But at the end of the day, Abraham is the man who's chosen. Abraham's the man who prevails with God. Abraham's the father of the faithful. And Lot is the one who just gets in by the skin of his teeth into God's heaven. But the Bible says that he loses everything at the fire. Make no mistake, that's where we are. The delusion that accompanies idolatry. God says, thou shalt have no other gods. Before me, he hasn't changed. He's not going to lower that for any of us. 
He says, I'm not sharing my throne with anyone. Except you take up the cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. That's it. It's exclusive. The Lord says, unless all is to me and you're totally out for me, God says, you cannot be my disciple. You can be an evangelical. You can be in the church. You can go through the system. You can be at the prayer meeting. But you cannot be my disciple, the Lord says. The delusion that accompanies idolatry. The third critical truth for the last days is God's departure. God's departure. You see, we read in chapter 9 and verse 3 of the beginnings of the top departure of God from Jerusalem and from the temple. The house that he had put up, that Solomon had built for his glory and for his name, and now the Shekinah, the conscious presence of Jehovah, that presence that is, is real, that presence which is, is powerful, that presence which is absolutely essential, that presence now is going. It's going. The great building's still there, priests are still there, the altar's still there, everything's still there, but Jehovah, representative of the presence of God, is moving out. God's on his way out. Moving out from his house. I want you to notice very quickly in 9 verse 3, chapter 9 and verse 3, the glory of the Lord, God of Israel, was gone up from the cherub, or between the cherubim and the Ark of the Covenant, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called for the man and so forth. And then we read, the verse, let me get it to you now. Yeah, chapter 3 again, the glory of the Lord, that is the Shekinah, was gone up from the cherub, and then it was moved to the threshold of the door. So I want you to notice initially, God's departure is a gradual departure. <coughs> it's a gradual departure. You'll not find God in the house in great power and glory one day and the next day he's gone. It doesn't happen like that. There is a gradual departure of God. Because God will reluctantly leave. It's not that God's desire to leave his house or to leave among his people. But God can be forced to leave and withdraw. It is gradual. It is literal. This is Jehovah leaving. This is the God of Israel leaving his temple. I want you to notice what this departure is related to. In chapter 8 and verse 6, look what God says to the prophet. He said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. It is related to sin. It's related to sin. The Lord says, I have no alternative here. The idolatry, the sin has got so bad in among my people. God says, I can't stay anymore. He says, I can't take it anymore. I'm, I'm going out. God's moving out. I want you to notice that when God departs, his protection departs with him. His protection departs with him. You see, this city, and if you look at it in the original Hebrew, city actually means a place which had watchmen. That's what designated it a city. It had men around the walls that were watching for the enemy coming. So they've got their defenses up. <coughs> Human defenses. Natural defenses. But the Lord says, I'm going. And once the Lord pulled back, then the six angels started on their move in, and they're coming in for judgment, and no amount of watchmen are going to stop it. You see, once God pulls back, judgment is inevitable. It's either the presence of God or judgment. It's one or the other. You can't do without the presence of God in the house of God. The one thing we should all ask ourselves when we go in and out of our places of worship is, is God in this place? Is the presence of God here? Because if God's not here, now men will say, oh no, that's wrong, that's not good. 
good preacher because God says we're two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Sure he is. He'll be down in the public house to watch and take note of what the ungodly are doing. He'll be in the house of God. He's everywhere. He's the omniscient, the omnipresent God. But we're talking about the presence of the Shekinah. The weight of the glory of God. God's departure, he removes his protection. You see, there's no safety in it anymore. There's no safety in having just the altar there. Prior to this happening, you read in the Old Testament, I don't know if you trust you do read the Old Testament scriptures, but you'll find that on occasions whenever some of, some of the Lord's people got into trouble, you know, they ran and they took hold of the horns of the altar. Protection. God says, when I'm gone, there's no protection now. You're not protected anymore. Don't be leaning on these religious relics around you as, as though they're going to protect you, for they're not, God says. That's why, brothers and sisters, it's good to have essential teachings in the church. It's good to teach the Word of God, and we need to. But, oh, we need to recognize that the priority is that we need the presence of God among us. And if we haven't the presence of God among us, judgment, one or the other. You see, is God going to come then and smite us down? Is God going to come and, and put us to hell? No, I'm not talking about that kind of judgment. Although that may be included, God knowing the hearts of everyone. But when God's presence drops back, there's no spiritual growth. When God's presence drops back, there's no going forward. God's departure makes everything common what was sacred. You see, God's presence sanctified everything. It was different. The presence of God made everything different. But now God's taken away. And look what he says to one of these men. <clears throat> if I can find it. Chapter, chapter 8, 9 and verse 7. Here's the Lord speaking. He said unto them, defile the house. God, about his own house, God says, defile it. In other words, God says, kill them. Put them to death. Do what you want in my house. I'm gone. See, my presence has a sanctifying influence, but God says, I'm gone now. And you see, once God goes, brothers and sisters, listen, anything can happen in the house of God. Years ago, the presence of God was, I'm sure, down in a greater degree and measure among the people of God. I'm not judge or jury, I'm just presenting what God's saying in his, in his word. But the presence of God had such an influence on the saints of God, an influence on the sinners. But in recent years, I don't know if you're hearing it, the, the cry of the old, some of the older saints and some of those that are other ones that are saying, look what's going on in the house of God. They're turning it into a circus. Well, listen, trying to stop the circus isn't going to resolve it. Trying to turn around and say, we need, we need to get back to old standards again. That's not going to resolve it. We need the presence of God back again. That's what's needed. And so anything can happen. There's no restraint anymore. No restraint. Free for all. Do what you like. Presence of God, God. You're not saved in the land. Go into the average house of God on Sunday morning, it's just like a chicken house. Before God, people. Presence of God, no consciousness of the presence of God. When the presence of God is down in a sanctuary or down in a place or down mightily in a prayer meeting, my dear friend, you're awed by God. There is an awe that comes upon you. You're in the presence of the God of heaven. God's departure. Another critical truth for the last days is sin in God's house is especially serious. Sin in God's house is especially serious. 
We read in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, let me quote it to you, many of you know it. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin with us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? It must begin at the house of God. It's very interesting where God sends these six men along with the other man, and he brings them in, and do you know where he brings them in? God sends them in at the altar. Right into the house of God. They start at the house of God. And God doesn't say to them, now boys, I want you to go out of the house of God and go and destroy all the godless in the city and then deal with anybody inside. No, God says, just start from the inside. Just do a clear out from the inside out. And don't stop. You see, the idolatry was right in the inside. It was right at the heart of the temple. And chapter 8 and verse 5, we read these words. Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, where the altar was, the image of jealousy in the entry. And that's where they bowed down, was right at the altar. You see, judgment commenced at the brazen altar. The brazen altar is one of the greatest illustrations in scripture of the person and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And yet it was at the place of maximum light that there they were in darkness. They had every shadow and every picture that God could throw at them and God could put to them. They were all there but they passed them by. hearers of the word lest you're deceived Ulster is full of people who love to hear the gospel who love to hear the word of God but are shy about implementing it and the deception in the land is that because they hear the word of God that they're going on with God no bigger delusion or lie ever fell on the church they're home tonight and they'll live just the same as the lived last week. Just be as corrupt. Just fill in as many forms wrong. Just tell as many lies. Just be as corrupt in business. Just be as prayerless and careless and godless in their lives as they were before they went into that evangelical center. Judgment commenced at the brazen altar. God says that's where it's going to start. I'll start where there was most light. God help you and I. God says that's where I'm going to start where there's most light. To whom much is given, much shall be required. It commenced at the brazen altar. It commenced with the elders, the old men. God didn't smite the youth first. It was the ancients of Israel. It was the old men. It was the men that were the upholders of the word of God. Those who were supposed to teach the word of God. Those who were in leadership in the houses of God. It was them representative that God came to in judgment. You see it says in the New Testament. It's better not to take on a responsibility in the house of God. And just to do it. And not be in it. And called by God. And clearly led by God. He said because you'll bear a heavier judgment. Leadership brings responsibility. In chapter 9 and verse 6 it says, Slay utterly old and young, maids, children, women, and come not near any man upon whom is marked, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And so the Lord starts cutting. You see, they have become the obstacles. They have been the ones who have led the others astray. They have been the ones that have took, taken the youth under their wing and the youth now were living off their example. God said sin in my house is especially serious. Very quickly. Critical truths for the last days. Mercy precedes judgment. The God of mercy. 
Mercy precedes judgment. God is going to forsake his house. God says, I can't stick it anymore. I'm pulling away. It's a gradual withdrawal, but I'm pulling away back from the church. Pulling away back from my people. They're not going to get the blessing the way they used to. Isn't that the cry in the land? Isn't that it? every preacher I've ever met that had a, 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 a sprinkling of spirituality? And every one of them have said the same thing. It seems as though we have done something terribly wrong. God's not moving in our land anymore. There's no conviction. People don't fear God anymore. There has to be an explanation. <coughs> we live at a time of divine destruction. Mercy precedes judgment. The Lord could have just sent in these angels and said, Right, boys, off you go. Just clear the deck. But he didn't do that. In among the majority, the six, with their battens and their weapons for killing, God has won in white linen. Picture of the Lord Jesus, high priest. White linen, purity. And he hasn't got a weapon. But he has got a little device, it's about nine, and a half, nine inches long, about one and a half inches wide, and about half inch in breadth. And he has it tucked into his girdle here. And it's a neat well. Pen, sometimes a pen knife, and the ink went in there. And the Lord has sent him. And the Lord has these six men gathered, and they're ready to do their business. And they come near, and it says in verse 2, And one man among them was clothed with linen, and a writer's inkhorn on his side, and they went in and stood. So they're all at the brazen altar, all of them standing. Nobody sees them but Ezekiel. They're all there. And the Lord said unto him, that was to the man with the linen, the mercy of God preceding the judgment of God. The Lord speaks to him and he says, go through all the city, the midst of it, go up and down the city. Don't miss any parts, go through, and set a mark upon the foreheads of them that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. God may forsake the house, but God will never forsake his children. Never. As we conclude, I want you to notice perhaps the most serious and the most searching aspect of it to my heart. Critical truths for the last days. God's people are different. God's people are different. It's a truth that is brought home with such power in this text and in this revelation to Ezekiel. As God permits us to look into something that man cannot naturally see. And God makes mention to this man and he sends him in in chapter 9. And he says, go through the midst of the city and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men. God makes mention of people. There are people that are mentioned to the angel in white. Heaven takes note that there are these people who are in among all the people. They're in every part and they're in every art and they're in every place and they're in every occupation and they're in every calling and they're in every place but they're peculiar people. Peculiar people. They're mentioned. The Lord takes note of them. We read in 2 Peter, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to deliver. You remember God took Lot out before he sent the judgment on Sodom? That's the kind of God he is. So God's people are different. They're, they're mentioned. But then I want you to notice that they're marked. They're marked. It says, set a mark upon the foreheads. Mark. Now that marking means scratched. It means a deep 
imprint on the forehead with this ink horn. Now, I have never been written on a pen. But if somebody took a pen or a, a scribe used the instrument of the inkwell and scribed that and imprinted and scratched onto your brow, that's going to be so. So they're marked out initially by a little pen. And you know, if you're to do the will of God in your life and you're going to serve God and you're going to be where God wants you to be, you are going to suffer some pains that the ungodly will not suffer. It's time in the church we wakened up, instead of trying to be popular, to win people and tell them, if you come to Jesus, you'll have joy, better to tell the whole truth. There's going to be a lot of problems too. There's going to be disappointments, there's going to be tears, there's going to be many of things that you wish didn't happen and it will happen. But listen, better to do the will of God and get to heaven and get the will done than live like the world for the world and die and go to hell. That's the reality. They're marked. Now it says that they were marked not on the elbow or on the knee or on the foot, but they were marked on the forehead. Now why were they marked on the forehead? Well, it's very clear that they were marked because it was the most obvious place. It was a conspicuous place. It was a prominent place. It was an open place. In other words, everybody knew that these were marked. You couldn't be a secret marked person. I was talking to a man during the week and he was talking about somebody who had died recently and I said, well, were they a believer? And he says, well, not sure. I said to him walking into one of his houses, I said, boy, when I would die, I'd want everybody to know that no matter what they thought about me, that boy was a Christian. I want that to be said about me when I die. That boy believed in the Bible. That boy tried to preach Christ. He tried to want it. That's what I want. Would you not want that? Would you not want people to be all standing on your grave while they like your hand and say, well, they're a Bible fanatic. They were always talking about Jesus. Or would you be like so many where they come to the grave and they scratch their head and say, I don't know. I don't know. He went to such and such an evangelical church. I never, I don't know what way he was. Well, that's between you and God, between me and God. But they were marked. And there was no hidden ones in Jerusalem. Anybody that had the mark, the Lord said to the angels, don't even go near them. They see the mark, don't even go near them. They were marked. Let's look at the manner of these people. The mannerisms, the characteristics of them. These people that God was to preserve for the last days in judgment. Look what God said about them. Set, among, set a mark upon all the ones that can preach the gospel and give out tracts. No. Set a mark upon all those that have their doctrine in place and all their wee dots dotted and their, their T's crossed. No. Set a mark upon all those who are interested in missionary work. No, all those things are good, maybe. Not against any of those things. But they're not the ones that God set aside as they to be marked. They should be among them. But who did God specifically set aside? He said, who do you, who do you watch out for? God says, here's, here's the characteristic, here's the mark of them. He said, listen, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that saw So God's looking for the sighing, crying saints. Now what does that mean? A sigh means an inward groaning. It means a pain or a grief or to gasp. That's what God's looking for. That's what the angel was looking for down through the streets of Jerusalem. Those that sigh have an inward groaning. And those that cry an outward expression. That tears frequently ran down their faces. To God's looking for. Those that 
that sigh and that cry. You see, these sighing, crying ones were those who were so controlled by the Spirit of God that the Lord put his burdens down on their thirsty hearts and as they prayed in the Holy Ghost, the very tears of the heart of God would flow through their eyes and they would weep and it would be a testimony against the ungodly around them. He would say, what are you crying about? What are you groaning about? What are you sighing about in Jerusalem? I'm sighing about the state of the land. I'm crying because I see that God will bring judgment if the people don't turn. That was the bearing of testimony by God through his people against a godless people. Jeremiah said, But if you will not hear it, that's the word of God. My soul shall weep in sacred places. My soul shall weep in sacred places. For your pride. And mine eyes shall weep sore. And run down with tears. Because the Lord's flock is carried away. Jeremiah is one of the men. It's quite a mark. Now don't go out of the meeting and say, listen, I'm going to sigh a lot more and I'm going to cry a lot. Don't waste your time. You're only doing the flesh. I'll tell you what to do. Just get right with God and just walk with God and live before God and be controlled by God and the Holy Spirit in his own good time and his own unique way he will put his tears into your heart you do that you can't switch them on and you can't switch them off and don't try but sometimes at a moment you least expect God will just reveal to you where the land is and your heart is broken and tears freely run. God said to me, I'm going sigh and cry. Let's conclude. You say there's lots of people sighing and crying today. There surely is. Some of them see it, some of them not. So is God just going to set a mark on the people that sigh and cry? No, no, no. The Lord is very conscious and aware of the motivations of our heart. And ultimately that's where the judgment falls. The Lord said, set a mark on the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. God says, what motivates you to cry? What moves you to weep? What moves you to react the way you're reacting in Jerusalem? And the answer from their soul with weeping tears, with hearts broken and with heavy spirits, they say, oh God, it is the abominations. It is the idolatry of thy people. It is the sin that is rampant among them. It is this, O oh God, that gives me my sighs and my tears. That many tears or sighs in our church prayer meeting shows now. Or the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. The late Leonard Ravenhill said something that's very true. He said, We'll never improve on the Holy Ghost. We've got to go God's way. And if God is to come back, we've got to come God's way. You see, the abominations were all form of immorality, lawlessness. The psalmist said, my eye, my eye runs down with tears because they keep not thy law.
Some said, horror has taken hold on me because the wicked forsake thy own. Again, brothers and sisters, listen, you can't, you can't work this up. You can't make it happen. You can't try to make your stuff like this. But if you get honest with God, and you cast yourself upon him, and you say, oh God, do something through me. Whatever it is. Oh God, put your mark on me. Put your mark on me. He'll do it. Be prepared for a little pain in taking on the cross. But be prepared for the protection of the Lord. Father, we come to thee. And oh Father, we open our hearts to thee. Father, I confess it's much easier to preach this than to live it. But I pray for grace in my life, Lord. I pray for grace in all our lives, Father. And I pray, Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, because it's not possible, Lord, any other way. Any other way is only legalism and bondage. I pray that the gracious Spirit of God would so come afresh upon us. Amen. And you would make us, Lord, a band of men and women who are sighing Jesus. and crying for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Father, set your mark on us, we pray. Mm -hmm. That heavenly mark that divine mark, that mark that heaven recognizes, even if it's not recognized on earth. Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a little time.